This is a system. It's the source of the Earth's rainfall and forms when air rises from hot lands or seas. This is because the air, thinking it's taking a break from the heat of where it came, becomes a breeze and reaches as far as it thinks it can. I mean, at this point, in the last 20 years, we've lived in a society that really favors individualism and the idea that each person is unique and special. And I think within the work, I'm more interested in not being that special, in loving the same things that everyone loves, of having the same fears or desires or, or things like that. I actually enjoy when people ask me, what, what, is, what is your art about? Um, I think a lot of people really hate that question, but like if I'm at a dinner or I'm in a non, non-art context, I kind of love it because I think it's a great test if I can answer it in like a sentence or two, then, and they can understand it, then I think that's good. And um, I, have, I have my elevator sentence, which is just that it's about the way that we value emotion in contemporary society. And the thing that has impacted that the most in the last 10 years is digital technologies. So how digital technology sure. impacts the human condition. We're so busy scrolling and refreshing pages like they were slot machines that it was harder to notice how things were being reorganized. Democracy was a shady bitch. I'm a huge fan of PDFs. Like I think this is a really untapped medium. If you go on my website, I have Google Docs. One, one of them is just my notes and has been my notes. Um, and that's open to the public and they can add things and say that they think something is stupid or something that they want other people to look at. Um, but, and that's been taken over by people. I think there's, at this point, very little of me in there and I kind of really like that. And your words are shallow given the depth of emotion and experience that the house holds for me. What do you think gives you the right to talk about memory in relation to this place? I have so many questions. I think um, the work becomes a way not to answer the questions, but almost to pass time with the questions. Um, so I would say that the last project that I did, a lot of that came from a lack of control. And I think that's something that we definitely feel in terms of our own impending deaths that we all seem to have weirdly accepted is going to happen. Um, things in your daily life, but then also a lot of the questions surrounding technology um, and what it means to us uh, and a lack of control on the one hand because of the thing itself, but also because of the mechanisms behind the thing. So the companies that make it or larger systems like governments and how they control the way that we use this. And the very simple fact that running through all of this is information which could mean so many different things. I mean, information is emotion to a certain extent. Like, if I'm crying, you know that I'm unhappy. If I'm laugh laughing, you can pretty much guess that I'm having a good time. And I think these things have, have a materiality that um, in the history of all time, we haven't been able to define. So you see this in things like when the telephone was first invented, people tried to hear the soul. When the x-ray machine was invented, people tried to see the soul. And I just think, I mean, not many people talk about the soul. It's not a very cool topic to discuss at like DLD or anything, or at Davos. Um, but I think it's still there. And I think this material and all of these questions that come out of this material has huge links to us and, and the things that we experience every day. I'm Phil, and I'm a digital replacement of a very famous actor. So Hyperlinks Where It Didn't Happen um, is the, the video is about the lives of a group of digital beings or digital agents and their search for meaning. So it's very sentimental to some extent, but that becomes a way uh, and these characters become a way to deal with different propositions that have popped up in the last few years. Um, and as, and I had sort of figured out certain characters, I knew I wanted an invisible woman very early on. I knew I wanted this po holographic pop star that was being used as a political tool from Japan to Dubai. Um, and uh, in the midst of all of this, I didn't really know, I wanted a narrator, but nothing had really emerged. And this actor dies, 
an actor that I uh, had grown up with and felt very strongly about. And very quickly after he passed, they, the studio made an announcement, because he was in the middle of a huge blockbuster franchise, um, that they would be digitally recreating him for the film to finish it. And they thought this would kind of assuage people's, you know, freakouts um, across the blogs. And of course, people had the opposite reaction. They were very upset, they were freaked out. Um, and, you know, and some people were excited at this idea. This is not new. I think in the history of film, this has happened for the last 30 years. Audrey Hepburn is in a Galaxy chocolate commercial from two years ago. And three months later, the director, in an interview, I got a notification for it, said that this, would, this was not happening. This would be a terrible idea. I think the language he used was really strong. And in that moment, I just thought, oh, they made that copy and it didn't work. It, was a it must have been a complete failure or grotesque or just too sad or something. And I just knew that that would, that would be the narrator for the film. And also that this position of failure could be something, um, something that I'm really drawn to and that helps me understand things. And also something that's very human um, and that could become the voice that introduces you to all of these, these different characters. And then from there, the film really became about control. And you can see this in, in all of the, the different characters um, who at some point become overwhelmed. Uh, with the amount of information and their lack of control over their own condition and whether or not they get to stay uh, where they are. And that's why the film, the film is a perfect loop. Uh, the end is also the beginning. Um, so instead of having an end, it just starts again. No, no, no stop, stop it. Please. I don't, I don't want, want to know. To know. Shh. It's all right. I know that. Don't tell me to be quiet. Oh, you're okay. Yeah. The poor guy is just suffering from a dissociative disorder. What is a dissociative disorder? I don't know. What are tater tots? I don't know. <laughs> Do you think that I could have a dissociative disorder? Hmm. Oh, you mean like you really are the famous actor, but you're so traumatized that you just think you're a bad 3D rendering of him? I think I'm not interested in people having what I want them to feel. I think it's more interesting when they, when that just happens and the work then sort of, in many ways, just becomes theirs. So, uh, for example, I've never even said, um, it becomes almost a, a weird tick. I've never said who the actor is who's in hyperlinks or it didn't happen. On, on the one hand, out of respect for the family because this is very much an homage, but also because I know that that actor's image is about your relationship. Your relationship was always to that moving image. Um, and I just think it's more interesting for it to live there with, with you or with uh, the viewer. All of these amounts of time were indiscriminate. Pray God you can hold. I stand outside. This woman's work. This woman's work. I think the fascination with digital technology comes uh, from the fact, well, it comes from two places. One, that I grew up with it, so I learned how to type on a typewriter, and within two years, I was learning how to use a computer. Um, but then also from an easy link between feelings and data, um, as these very visceral things that do take up space. It's been proven that data has a weight. It lives in huge buildings. Um, and emotion less, there's less of a conversation around that. But it's something that has a presence, that has a physical impact um, on people. And I think just that the internet for now is the place in which the most of that circulates. Um, I do think that will change. I think there is, I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that the internet that we use, so the World Wide Web, um, is not what it was intended to be. So Tim Berners-Lee, uh, he created this platform, the World Wide Web, and I think he doesn't, he says he doesn't even recognize it anymore. And it's become very territorial uh, in the same way that, you know, our physical earth has become. Um, and I think as those territories get set up, and there are, there is a race for companies 
um, I think, who started out as one thing. So maybe they start out as a social media or a search engine. Um, and you can see Facebook and Google expanding and starting to transition to become something else. So to become the platform or the filter through which we get the, all of this information circulates. So I think that's something we'll see change. So the idea that the virtual is real, I think, comes from a place that I just don't believe in the word virtual. I think uh, the first time I've heard the, the word virtual used correctly was two days ago when someone said there was a virtual tie between uh, Bernie S Sanders and Hillary Clinton. That's the correct term, but the way we've been using it is to describe something that isn't real, that's fake. Um, and I just don't, I just don't think that's an effective way. I mean, when you have uh, drones that are used in warfare and uh, most people meet their loved ones online and then have children. I mean, this is, these are really stupid examples, but they're direct, clear examples of how there is no, that it's just a reality. Um, and there's other things like within, within my practice. So I work with a network of people who live around the world uh, who have different skills. And for example, the 3D modeler who made Phil, who was the narrator in Hyperlinks or It Didn't Happen, he was living in Iran and we had to figure out how to pay him because at the time there were sanctions on Iran. And this becomes such a quick reminder that we're still bound by the real world. Um, people ask these questions or have this worry about as though things were just going to float away or disappear. And it's not like everything, the whole, the real world is going to evaporate and you know, be usurped by this thing is that in the best possible case scenario, it's a collaboration between the two and it becomes a prosthesis for things that we're not able to do as opposed to a substitute. I wouldn't say that there's a single theme running through it aside from this idea that emotions are a material and that there is this link to data as a material and that these things circulate in ways that we do and don't have control over. I think when I first started making work, it was very much about the comedy of the representation of emotion and just how funny that is. Like, um, so something like the tear started crying, started out as something very scientific. It sends a signal to your brain to release endorphins that help you, that are basically painkillers. And then at some point, um, humans evolved to use crying for other things uh, as a self-therapy, as a way to communicate that they're in pain or that someone is doing something that they don't want them to do anymore. Um, and then that goes all the way up until now where the use of crying in reality TV is an incredibly different tool, but also equally fascinating. Um, in, in some way, um, and also the way within like news media that crying is used. So I think there's been, for me at least, a transition in just like simply showing the representations of emotion and using those representations as a tool to say something completely different or to point to, to something the else. is about the past. A poet has reported that a portrait painter has made an image so lifelike that it could be life itself. After completing the portrait, he stepped back and exclaimed, this is indeed life itself, only to discover that the portrait... I think the most important task, not for all artists, but for artists who want to make contemporary work, is just to listen um, and to listen to your, not just to your audience, but to the audience like a global kind of we, and to really participate in that we. Um, it's something that I try when I'm working through something is to think about who, not who's 
yeah, who is this for? And for it to really be about a general public or a general audience, and for it never to be about a joke that's on them, or something that I want to take back to an art context and say the world is like this, or just a mirror that I want to hold up to someone, but to participate in the time and the world that we're living in, because I, I think it's insane. Um, and I think we, as, as peers or as a group of artists living now, we have a unique opportunity to participate in that now in a way that I think was not, was not present before. Um, and also in that there, are, there is a whole other art world that exists outside of an institutional one that doesn't need us to some extent. And I think it's really nice just to think about that. Thank you.